Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to go through a question which is all about public goods and in the question I demonstrate what we call vertical summation and we will have an example of free riding and also an example of the underproduction of a public good. I will do the question over two videos just to make it easier for me to produce and I'll link to that second video in the description below when it's ready. So here's my question. Joe's demand for recreational parks is equal to P is equal to 100 minus QJ and Mary's demand for recreational parks is equal to P is equal to 40 minus QM over 3. In part A we are asked what is the social marginal benefit function and in this question we are asked to take recreational parks to be a public good. And in part B we are asked what happens if the price slash marginal cost of recreational parks is equal to 80. What about if the price slash marginal cost is equal to 120? So in this video, I'll just do part A. I'll do part B in the second video. Again, link to that video in the description. All right, let's start by thinking about our social marginal benefit function. I've drawn out Joe and Mary's individual demand curves here. And the first thing that is good to understand is that our demand and our demand curves can be interpreted as tracking the marginal benefit of consumption for each unit. And it is important that we really recognize that this interpretation is for each marginal unit. So just to demonstrate, for the sixth recreational park, for instance, and let's take Joe, we can tell how much benefit that Joe gets from that sixth recreational park by taking the height of his demand curve at Q is equal to six. And we can use Joe's demand equation to find this height. We would just substitute Q is equal to six into Joe's demand function. So we get P is equal to 100 minus 6, so 94. Now the standard interpretation of this point on Joe's demand curve is that if the price was 94, Joe will demand 6 units. The interpretation in terms of marginal benefit is that Joe's marginal benefit of consumption for the 6th recreational park is equal to 94. And so when we're working with questions that talk about marginal benefit, our price axis, our vertical axis, which gives us the height of our demand curve, can also be thought of as telling us about our marginal benefit. Algebraically too, with our demand functions, we can replace our price variable with a variable tracking marginal benefit. So for instance, with Joe, we would have MB subscripts Joe, Joe's marginal benefit would be equal to 100 minus QJ. We can do the same thing with Mary too, we can replace the price variable with a marginal benefit variable and we get MB subscript M, Mary's marginal benefit, is equal to 40 minus QM over 3. So we've managed to get our marginal benefit functions for our individuals from their demand curves. And let's just check that sixth unit for Mary. It will be useful for us later. Mary's marginal benefit of consumption for the sixth recreational park would be equal to 40 minus six over three is equal to 38, and I can put that on her diagram. Now our social marginal benefit function is going to be a comprehensive measure of the benefit afforded to everyone who gains benefit as a result of the consumption of a good. So we're going to include in the function all externalities, all third parties who are affected because a unit of, in this case, recreational parks is consumed. And this is important for us because as the question indicates, recreational parks are often considered to be fairly good examples of what we call a public good. They are both, at least sometimes, non-rivalrous and non-excludable. So my use of the park does not prevent another person from using the park, that's non-rivalry. And it's really hard to exclude others from using the park. Recreational parks are very big and very hard to keep people out, that's non-excludability. So basically then, very roughly, recreational parks are just the sort of goods where many people can use and gain benefit from the same park at the same time. So if we want to account for the benefit gained as a result of a recreational park being bought and produced and consumed, we really need to use a social marginal benefit function that takes into consideration all of the benefit that is being enjoyed by everyone who uses the park. Now I did do another video on public versus private goods if you want more information on this distinction and I'll link to that video in the description. And I really should make some caveats at this point. 
because you may have experienced going to a park and it being so busy that you just can't enjoy it. So recreational parks can definitely be rivalrous sometimes. Or we might think if a park is smaller, we could fence it off and put cameras up and guards so we can monitor all entrances. And that would definitely help us from excluding others from using it. And so in these situations, the parks are not good examples of public goods. But some recreational parks can be good examples of public goods, I think, especially if we imagine, for instance, that the park we're talking about is really, really big. So many people can use it at the same time without getting in each other's way. And that would make it really, really hard to exclude people as well. So let's just imagine that this is the sort of good that we're talking about. Now for our question here, the status of the recreational park as a public good means both Joe and Mary receive benefit from the same marginal park. And so our social marginal benefit function will be equal to Joe's marginal benefit plus Mary's marginal benefit. And that sum will kind of give us our social marginal benefit function, but we do need to be careful because it's not quite the whole story. To see why, let's look at these marginal benefit curves again, but I'm going to redraw them this time on the same axes. So Joe's marginal benefit curve is blue and Mary's is green. And you can see, or I hope you can see, for these units from zero to 100 inclusive, both Joe and Mary have marginal benefit associated with those units. And what we're looking at is we're looking at the horizontal quantities and looking up to the height of the marginal benefit curves at each of those quantities. And both Joe and Mary get marginal benefit from all these units. So over these quantities then, our social marginal benefit function will be equal to the sum then of Joe and Mary's marginal benefit curves. Now I am including the point Q is equal to 100 here, even though technically Joe's marginal benefit is exactly equal to zero for that 100th recreational park. And I'm doing that just because, well, the point Q is equal to 100 is still technically part of Joe's domain of his marginal benefit function. So I'm including that in the sum for our social marginal benefit as well. For any quantity after 100 though, you can see that Joe's marginal benefit curve just doesn't exist. He doesn't get any benefit from those quantities. So our social marginal benefit will just be equal to Mary's only she benefits from these quantities. So we get to the following algebraic formulation then, our social marginal benefit function will be equal to the sum of Joe and Mary's marginal benefit functions if the quantity is above or equal to zero or below or equal to 100, but it would just be equal to Mary's marginal benefit if the quantity is greater than 100. Substituting that in our equations, we see that social marginal benefit is equal to then well, 100 minus QJ, that's Joe's marginal benefit, plus 40 minus QM on three, that's Mary's. And actually I can just remove the subscripts J and M here that identify the quantities as Joe's or Mary's because as we said before, one quantity can be enjoyed by both. So we get 140, which is 100 plus 40 minus Q minus Q on three. And we can rewrite the middle term as three Q on three so 3Q on 3 is actually just Q, but rewriting it like this allows us to take those last two terms away from one another. So we get 140 minus 4Q on 3. That's our social marginal benefit function. If Q is greater than or equal to 0 and less than or equal to 100. But our social marginal benefit function will just be equal to 40 minus Q on 3. That's Mary's marginal benefit function if Q is, is greater than 100. Now visually it all looks like this, at Q is equal to zero, we sum Mary's marginal benefit, that's 40, plus Joe's, that's 100. And so our social marginal benefit is 140. That's our marginal benefit axis intercept of our social marginal benefit function. The next point we can think about is what happens when Q is equal to 100? Well, our social marginal benefit is equal to the sum of Joe and Mary's curves at this point, but Joe's marginal benefit is exactly equal to zero at this point. So our social marginal benefit curve, we know will just sit right on Mary's. Joining those two points together, I hope you can see that that red orange line, that's the sum of the heights of Mary and Joe's marginal benefit functions. For the quantities after Q is equal to 100, our social marginal benefit is just equal to Mary, so we will follow her line. So our social marginal benefit curve has a kink at quantity is equal to 100. We can see that algebraically and also visually with our red-orange line. 
And what we've done here is vertical summation. We've summed up Joe and Mary's marginal benefit curves. We call this vertical summation because we're summing up the variable that's tracked on the vertical axis, which is a marginal benefit of consumption. Now we can check all of our calculations and also show this for an individual unit by remembering previously at the beginning of the video, we found that Joe's marginal benefit for the sixth recreational park was 94, while Mary's was 38. Now, if we add those two marginal benefits up together, we get 132. If we sub Q is equal to six into our social marginal benefit equation, and it will just be that first part because Q is equal to six is less than 100, we get 140 minus four times six over three. Now four times six is 24, 24 over three is eight, so we get 132. So we've got the same number, we've confirmed our algebra, and it's another way of really showing what vertical summation does. Given that we're dealing with a public good for that sixth recreational park, both Joe and Mary get benefit from that park. So finding the social marginal benefit consists of adding their marginal benefits up together. So that's it for this first part of the question. Please go ahead and check out part B if you're interested. If you're looking at this a few days after I've uploaded this video, it might not be up yet. I might not have finished kind of producing the video, but I hope to get it up within a week. I really hope that this video helped. If it did, please like and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you guys have a great day.